Let's now apply conservation of mechanical energy into the physical pendulum. Now, as a quick reminder, the physical pendulum is a physical object with a certain shape and size that oscillates back and forth about a pivot. And one of the important quantities in that case is the distance h between the pivot and the center of mass. Now, that's because, of course, the center of mass is where the weight force is applied, and so that distance is going to matter for torque. Turns out that distance is also going to matter for gravitational potential energy. Now, when we did the simple pendulum, we took the lowest point in the swing to be the origin for gravitational potential energy. Nothing wrong with that, but to change things up a bit and show you that you could choose a different reference for gravitational potential energy, I'm going to choose this level here. So at the pivot, gravitational potential energy is zero. And therefore, everywhere throughout the swing, the center of mass is below my reference, therefore has negative gravitational potential energy. And all I have to know is how far below. And the answer is that, well, how far below is given by this distance here. And so this is how far below the center of mass is. And this is going to be h cosine of theta. Now, careful, the distance itself is h cosine theta, but the gravitational potential energy will be negative. So if you wanted to apply conservation of mechanical energy between, let's say, this point and this point in the motion, and you want it to be as general as possible, you would write kinetic energy, which, careful, is rotational kinetic energy, one-half I P omega initial squared, where I P is the moment of inertia, with respect to the pivot, and I would know exactly what that is if I knew the shape of this object, or maybe I was just given what the moment of inertia is, but to be general, we'll just call it IP. And then how much uh, gravitational potential energy does this thing have? Well, it has a negative amount. If this is H and this is theta initial, let, let's just call this theta final, then minus mgh cosine theta initial is equal to one-half ip omega final squared minus mgh cosine of theta final. Now, of course, as we've said before, the art of applying conservation of mechanical energy is choosing two points that are perhaps more interesting and more informative than the arbitrary two points that I chose here, but my goal was simply to show that you have rotational kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. And so at any moment in time, the mechanical energy is split between the two. And if we look at the graphs like we have for other oscillators, we'll find that this is what we have. We have an oscillator that turns around at the endpoints and therefore is not rotating and has no kinetic energy at the endpoints and then reaches its max kinetic energy as it swings through the equilibrium position as expected. And so here's the graph of kinetic energy. And on the other hand, of course, for gravitational potential energy, you would have the largest amount here and the lowest amount down here. And so you would have a curve that looks like this. And of course, that makes sense because the mechanical energy is always going back and forth between kinetic and gravitational potential energy. And wherever kinetic is zero, potential energy is max. Wherever kinetic is max, potential energy is min, if not zero, right? It's the, it's the minimum value here for you. So very similar to the symbol pendulum, um, nothing too different there, and nothing very difficult in terms of reproducing these graphs or analyzing them if they're given to you. So to be consistent throughout all these videos, 
now that we've talked about the motion and how the energy is distributed between each point in the motion, let's apply this property of mechanical energy, which is that if it's conserved, you can take the derivative with respect to time, and it should give you back the differential equation for the motion of this oscillator. And so if we write mechanical energy at any arbitrary point, we're going to get one-half IP omega squared minus mg h cosine of theta. And so this is at an arbitrary point, and that entire quantity remains constant. So if you take the derivative with respect to time, dm dt, you know that you're going to get zero here, and that's going to be one-half ip times 2 omega d omega dt, actually plus here mgh because minus cosine gives you sine, but careful chain rule d theta dt. Now recall that omega is d theta dt. And recall also that omega here is the angular velocity, not the angular frequency. So I mentioned this before, is that we have a problem with notation. Let's just for now agree that any omega that we've written is angular velocity. And then we can worry about finding the angular frequency once we get the differential equation. So this is zero, and it's going to be ip uh, omega d omega dt is... Well, technically it's alpha, but it's better to write it d2 theta dt squared plus mg h sine theta, and this is omega. Okay, so the omegas go away. And if we put this in standard form, we almost get the differential equation that we're looking for. So we get d2 theta dt squared plus mg h over IP sine of theta. And of course, you don't want sine of theta, you just want theta. So we do need the small angle approximation for this oscillator, just like we needed it when we wrote torque net equals I alpha previously in a different video. So the small angle approximation says that sine of theta is approximately theta as long as theta is very small in front of one radian. And so, under that assumption, we do get the differential equation that we were hoping to get, d2 theta dt squared plus mgh over i p theta. And this is the differential equation for the harmonic oscillator, and therefore we know that this quantity here is omega squared, where omega is now the angular frequency. And again, there's a good reason why we chose the same letter. It's just a matter of understanding what you're writing, right? Don't, don't get the two confused, even though they're the same letter. If it helps, you can always call the angular frequency. Sometimes it's called the proper angular frequency for a given oscillator. You can call it omega zero, just so that you avoid any confusion with angular velocity. So you could do that. I, you know, it's a habit and I, I haven't taken the habit, so I often just write omega and, and don't think twice about it. But um, since I do not write omega zero, it would be only fair for me to, to point out that there is a little bit of an issue with the notation here. So make sure you keep that in mind. And as long as you are careful, you don't need to indicate it. But if it makes more sense, just put omega zero here and at least you won't get the two confused. So all in all, pretty similar to the symbol pendulum, um, and we get um, the differential equation that we had derived previously for the physical pendulum by applying torque net equals I alpha. Thanks for watching this video. We created Cogverse Academy to help you save time by focusing on what matters most when studying for exams. If you'd like to learn how Cogverse Academy can personally help you improve your grades, 
Check us out at congressacademy.com and send us an email if you have any questions. We'd love to help you.